My name is Catherine Cronin, uh, and I work for the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And I'll introduce my co-presenters here in just a moment. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is, as you can see, developing enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning. And this is the fifth webinar in the National Forum's webinar series, um, which we've, we've been running all this spring and summer. The purpose specifically of today's webinar is to share developments in this particular area of developing enabling policies and to invite your feedback, which we'll, we'll all explain as we're going along. Um, and in advance, I will apologize. Um, my voice is a little bit hoarse, I'm just recovering from a cold, um, but I have a big glass of water next to me. Um, I invite you to um, introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like to say hello. Uh, the webinar is gonna be re recorded today. Um, and we'll share that with you afterwards. Um, throughout the entire webinar, we really would like to encourage as much engagement and participation as possible. So we welcome your comments, your questions. Um, there's a team of five of us who are presenting so we can interact with you in the chat, you know, when we're not actually speaking. Um, we also have a couple of polls where, we're, where, we're, where we will be inviting your input. Um, and as we will be specifically exploring inclusion and engagement in today's webinar, specifically in the context of policymaking, we'd also like to invite you, if you wish, to add information to your Zoom name to say a little bit more about you. So, for, for example, you might want to add to your name your institution, um, your country, if you're joining us from outside Ireland, your pronouns, um, anything that you'd like to share. This is not a requirement. Um, but we'd like to, again, to encourage interaction and engagement throughout the webinar. So um, if you haven't done, if you haven't edited your Zoom name before, um, you can do that simply by hovering over um, your little profile image in the Zoom meeting. Um, and then either right click name to, to find the rename option or click the three dots um, in the upper right corner of your image and choose rename. And again, anything you wish to add just to describe yourself um, would be welcome, but it's not a requirement. So um, the outline really for today is that we, we're going to describe briefly at the start a bit of background, a bit of the work that the National Forum has done in this area of um, developing enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning, um, work that's been done to support individuals and institutions, um, and it, to support decision-making in this area. So we'll describe work that's been done. We're gonna share a case study of one institution's um, blended and online learning policy. Um, and then we're going to explore some key questions, as you can see here. So um, what are important policy areas for you in your context? And we'll, we'll, we'll invite your feedback on that. And what exactly are enabling policies anyway? What does that word enabling mean when it qualifies um, the word policy? How can we ensure adequate engagement in policymaking, particularly at this time? Um, and uh, one that often uh, generates a lot of discussion is, you know, do I need a policy or do I just need a guideline or set of guidelines? We'd like to explore all these questions today. So um, before we get started, though, I'd like to introduce uh, the five speakers today. Uh, I'm Catherine Cronin, as I said, strategic education developer uh, in digital and open education with the National Forum. Chloe Power is also with the National Forum. Chloe is the student associate intern. Um, Neve Brennan is joining us from Trinity College Dublin, where she is research informatics um, program manager. Tony Murphy is head of quality enhancement and innovation and teaching and learning at Dublin Business School. And Sarah O'Toole is education developer at Limerick Institute of Technology. So um, just we're kind of retracing to the National Forum's kind of history in this area of support for developing enabling policies. In 2018, the National Forum published um, a guide, and I think someone will, will put the link in the chat in case you have, aren't aware of this already. Um, it's, it was called A Guide to Developing Enabling Policies for Digital Teaching and Learning. It was developed following wide consultation across the higher education sector in Ireland uh, and a review of policies both in Ireland and internationally. And it did two things really. It proposed a definition of enabling policies uh, and it outlined eight steps to developing enabling policies. Um, but of course, we didn't stop in 2018 in terms of supporting, um, in, as I said, individuals and institutions in this area. Oh, sorry. Um, the National Forum indeed recognizes the importance of institutional policymaking, um, especially now um, to address the needs of students and staff and to guide decision making. So since 2018, 
We've conducted a series of regional workshops with collaborating with colleagues across the sector. Uh, we've had conversation and continuing consultation across the sector, and we've shared you know, what's, what happened and, and what was learned at those workshops at various events. Most recently probably was the EdTech Winter Conference just a few months ago. Um, I presented there with Javier Atenas and Leo Haveman, um, who are doing important policy work in the open education space. But I suppose what's most um, relevant today is that we recognize that there are specific needs in this space at this time in, in so-called post-COVID context, um, where institutions are necessarily developing policies in areas where they didn't have them before because of our changed context, or redeveloping existing policies which didn't meet the needs um, of our changed context. So we have this small cross institutional team, which is your team of presenters today, that's been collaborating for the past several months on designing a new guide, updating that, that 2018 guide. That guide's due to be published in September, 2021. So we've done, we've done a lot of work through this engagement, as I explained, but we also know that we, we really would like to wider consultation and we're, we'd like to use today's webinar as an opportunity to draw you know, from all of your experiences and ideas to make this guide as good as it can be um, to support the sector. So um, the first area is that we, um, based on discussions across the sector, feedback from national form associates, we know that there are some key policy areas um, when we're talking about digital and open teaching and learning. And these are things like lecture recording policies, virtual classroom policies, blended and online learning policies, but also more broadly, online assessment policies, perhaps learning analytics policies, and even OER and IP policies. Um, but obviously that's not a complete list and we would like to know what's important to you. So um, we'd like to share you to share your responses in the Mentimeter poll um, to enter you know, these policies, if these are key policy areas for you, or perhaps something that's missing from this list um, in the area of digital and open teaching and learning, um, that's an important policy area for you. So, sorry, now I'll just, um, there's, um, can you see the Menti slide there? Okay, great. So if you go to menti.com, you can use the code that's at the top of your screen. Um, I think there might also be a link in the chat. Um, and we just invite you to identify what you see as key policy areas for you in the area of digital and open teaching and learning. Perhaps it's lecture recordings, perhaps it's online assessment, perhaps it's something else entirely. Um, and I'll give you about 30 seconds or a minute to do that. Okay, very interesting. Academic integrity, data protection, online learning, high flex learning, student success, OER, assessment, teaching allocation. Whoever entered that, you can, you can add something else if you wish, if something is missing. Data protection. Universal design for learning, blended learning academic integrity again, GDPR. Very interesting. Um, if you would like to qualify what you're entering on the word cloud here, please feel free to add some um, additional detail in the chat. Um, we will have time for q and I should have said at the end. Um, so, so we'd like to explore what, what arises um, in the context of the first 40 minutes or so of the webinar. We'd like to, to kind of dive into that in some more detail. But I will say that all of your responses here um, are going to be really important to us as we, as I said, develop um, the new version of the guide. So thank you for this. Okay, before I leave this, I'll just want to identify that the top themes seem to be academic integrity, data protection, learning analytics, accessibility, recording, contact hours, assessment. Okay, great. Um, I'll return to our presentation. And what I'd like to do now is to hand over to my colleague, Sarah O'Toole from Limerick Institute of Technology. And Sarah's gonna present a specific case study of blended, a blended and online learning policy. Thanks, Catherine. So I...
I'm just going to give an overview of the process that LIT went through back in 2018 around the development of the blended and online policy. So the reason it was developed um, was because at the time, the recently published st strategic plan prioritised the need to um, enhance our flexible model of education and include new online and blended programmes. And also the recently published teaching and learning strategy at the time also had kind of key goals around the development of a set of best practice principles for blended and online delivery. And it was also highlighted the importance for the integration of technology enhanced learning across programs. So then on the next slide, um, I just want to kind of give you an overview of maybe kind of how the policies, policies are developed within LIT. So, for example, within LIT, there's several, you've got academic council and there's several subcommittees which report into academic council. And it was the academic quality teaching and learning subcommittee that was tasked with developing the policy. So from this subcommittee, um, a working group was set up. So the working group was set up in October 2017, and there were 16 members from uh, LIT staff and uh, the students union were also involved. And uh, they made up the working group. And basically, the timeline for development was from October to May. So we met five times over that uh, kind of six month period. And the policy was then developed and brought back to the subcommittee for approval and then went back to the Academic Council. So that's kind of how it was. Um, I suppose that's kind of the process that we went through um, for, for setting it up. Um, on the next slide, then, I just wanted to kind of point out or kind of highlight like what the key aims for the policy were. So one of the first things we needed to identify was what, what is the purpose of this policy and what's the aim of it? And really uh, the policy outlines what the guiding principles for the development and delivery of blended and online programs um, should be within the Institute. And it was really, it was developed as an enabling resource to facilitate the provision of blended and online programs across all of the campuses within LAT. And the, the policy specifies the relevant quality assurance and enhancement measures that are required to adhere to best practice and to the relevant quality standards. So I suppose it was those guiding principles and those quality assurance measures that we really wanted to get across in our policy. So on the next slide, then we kind of, I suppose the first thing we did is we started looking at the data. We did kind of did an initial kind of data gathering. So there was a review of sure the area of blended and online learning was kind of conducted by the working group. And this was, you know, um, kind of at three kind of different levels. You had, I suppose, at an organizational level, we had our strategic plan, our teaching and learning strategy, and then also the quality assurance policies that we would have to adhere to. And then at a national level, um, it was great to be able to access the reports and all the work that's been done by the National Forum. And then also the, the reports from QQI. And they really did kind of help to inform the group about look, national developments across the sector. And then finally, we, kind of, we looked at, in, at, a, at an international level. Kind of we looked at the various reports to kind of help identify look, what direction is blended and online teaching and learning going and where do we want to fit in with that as well. So um, on the next slide then, what we kind of felt was that, look, the policy, um, QQI had released uh, quality assurance guidelines for providers for blended learning programs, and that was published in March 2018. So we felt that the guidelines were a, a great kind of opportunity for us to maybe kind of organise the policy or the prior, the principles or the priorities of our policy around this. So these, so we organised our policy under organised in a, within an organisational context, a program context, and a learner experience context. So at an organisational kind of context, this was really about look, ensuring that the provision of blended and online programs aligns to our institutional policies and strategies, and that there's also a standardised support and induction for staff that are going to be maybe teaching in a blended or an online program. Maybe looking then at a program context, well, what does that mean? And I suppose really it was for us to kind of say that, you know, we, we need to look here to ensure the programs have been implemented um, you know, with a learning design model that's reflective of online learning, that also active learning, which would be our signature pedagogy, has been implemented into the programme. Um, so it was really more looking at the kind of the design issues. And then again, looking at um, online assessment um, validity and making sure that those kind of issues are addressed. And then also resourcing. I suppose the final area then, um, which is the learner experience context, really looked at, you know, what do we need to put into our document to ensure that we're giving students the information around the time commitment, what technical skills they might need to have, and then also what supports um, can be put in place um, and are available to students who are going to be participating in an online course. So that's really, um, so we use the QQI guidelines to structure our policy. Um, and then on the next slide, I suppose it's the next slide then really kind of just kind of, I suppose, 
suppose it kind of what we did is we did all this this data gathering we had our aims and then we kind of felt you know what we reviewed the content and we had a lot of additional information that was really useful for supporting staff but not necessarily suitable for a policy document so we kind of agreed that look the best thing to do was to create a number of supporting guidelines guiding gu guides um and these really this kind of helped us to maybe kind of see where the line was between what goes into a policy and what should go into our guidelines so for us our policy an example of this would be, you know, we needed to have our institute definition. So what do we mean at an institute level when we say blended? What do we mean when we say online? And that had to be part of the policy. Also, then key principles around assessment and the learner experience. And then we also had developed um, a set of templates and these templates helped um, staff to kind of design and structure their, their programs. And we felt that these were really important and needed to be part of the policy. Then we had other information such as learning design frameworks, you know, more kind of informational information kind of resources, technical set of guides. So if you're setting up, if you're doing recording at home, these are kind of suggested things to do. And really, we felt these, this information is not long in the policy, but still really useful. So we set up those three kind of supporting guides for our staff as well. So I suppose on the next slide then, where are we now, 2021? And I suppose, so the policy was approved in 2018. And I suppose just from, uh, I suppose, an impl implementation point of view, the mapping templates have been very useful. So all new program guidelines um, have them included in the documentation. We've ran a number of CPD initiatives um, that have kind of come out from the policy. And there's also a kind of a training room and a dedicated kind of recording room for staff. So when we look back, we're, we're now at a stage where we're actually rewriting the policy and we can kind of look back and say, okay, what was good with the policy? What do we want to change? And I suppose two huge things have happened since we initially developed that policy. The first one being the COVID pandemic and the shift to emergency remote teaching. So a lot of the knowledge and skills that we might have put into the documentation document really could be taken out now at this stage. We feel that, you know, the baseline of of staff's digital literacy skills has just gone up so much that we really don't need to be explaining it. And even when you look back at the, the document uh, from 2018, we're, we're maybe kind of over explaining it. But at the time it felt relevant, whereas now we're feeling, look, we can actually move that into more kind of supporting documentation. And then also it really highlighted the need for additional initial policies such as the lecture recording policy. And then of course we have been designated, um, LIT and NAIT have, uh, will be merging and we've been designated as the next Technological University. So on the 1st of October, we're going to become the Technological University of Shannon, Midlands, Midwest. So as a result of that, all of our policies have to be updated. So it's a really good chance for us to kind of evaluate the policy. And just on the next slide then, I suppose, um, it's just a kind of a summary of kind of where we are now. So again, there were several working groups that were set up with staff from LIT and AIT. And these working groups were originally set up as part of the um, TU application process. And this work is continuing now with the development of some of these policies. So we have a working group and we're currently going through the steps, trying to see are we making the policy enabling and also, you know, what are we doing? And some of those key things, you know, the language, the amount of text that we have in, in it, um, we're trying to see look where is the best place for it is it is it in the policies or is it in the guide is it in the policy or is it in our supporting guidelines and i suppose as well we're also just trying to identify what are those key principles that we want in our policy that align with our teaching learning and assessment policy and also align with the other new tu and um, institutional st uh, strategy documents so then my final slide, I suppose, really in summary is just to kind of, I suppose, for me, it's just to highlight, you know, it's an, you know, policies and guidelines, it's, an, it's a kind of continuous evaluation and it's a continuous process where you need to kind of ensure that the information inside in your policies is relevant and in line with the current context that, that that you're kind of in and key to policy development uh, to this process I think really is identifying what should be included in your policy and what should be um, placed in your supporting guidelines and I suppose in, in the context of this it really all, it came back to um, two things the guiding principles and the quality assurance me measures that are needed for the development and the implementation of the policy so and it's in key that they are put into the policy rather than a support document or a support guide if they are to be implemented consistently across the institution. So I suppose that's just a quick summary of um, a kind of case study of the policy, the blended and online policy in LIT and kind of where it's going. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague Tony Murphy who's going to talk about uh, enabling policies. Thanks Tony. Thanks Sarah. So um, as Catherine said at the outset, the purpose of today really is to take this guide that was uh, published in 2018 out for a walk and maybe just kind of test it a bit. 
um, slap it around a little bit. Um, so over the next five minutes, what I'm going to be doing is uh, reflecting um, on the guide using uh, Sarah's story from LIT as a case study um, uh, to to kind of um, test the guide and see to what extent the test to what extent the guide lived up to the practice of developing a policy um, uh, for digital teaching and learning. So. Um, uh, yeah, to, 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 to look at the set, the, what, the, the, what the, the guide essentially did was laid out these eight steps. Um, and if we reflect on um, Sarah's story, while I'm reflecting on Sarah's story, what I'd encourage participants to do is to get involved in the chat. Um, I'm going to pick fault um, with the guide. Uh, using Sarah's story, look at what's what, what we're trying to identify, what's missing, um, uh, where the where the guide can really be improved, and I'll be using Sarah's story to try and draw out some of that. And what I'd encourage you to do in chat is to is to either use Sarah's story, or use your own personal experience from developing policies um, inside your own institutes, and and maybe reflect on these eight steps and the and the nature of the guide, and pick a little bit of fault with it. So when I listen to Sarah, there the first thing that kind of that um, that um, uh, I identified really as being uh, missing from the guide was this idea that um, the LIT team uh, stated the aims of the policy uh, of the policy development work up front, front and center, and they had a very clearly defined set of aims that they were trying to achieve, um, which I thought was very useful. Um, the second thing that um, the second thing that I, I thought was interesting from Sarah's story was this idea that they defined the working group and the roles that need to be represented on that working group. I think the 16 roles on that working group. And the guy wouldn't necessarily go to that level of detail in terms of, um, you know, defining who should be involved in this and where you should go to, to draw on the resources within your institute, which I thought, again, was another uh, very useful thing that I think served, um, served LIT well. Um, in terms of the data gathering and um, uh, uh, the consultation that they that they, that they um, engaged in, again, um, the the, the um, this is something we're going to touch on a couple of times now this this afternoon. But uh, this idea of of how wide or how narrow do you go in terms of consultation, um, and what what does consultation really really mean in terms of develop, developing a policy. Um, my own personal experience is that I've gone, uh, when I've been involved in policy development, I've done both. I've gone too wide and I've also gone too narrow. Um, and, and the policy development process has suffered as a result. So that idea of trying to define consultation, what, what we mean by consultation, I think is very important. And the guide doesn't really touch on that too much. And I think there could be some clarity from the guide on that. Um, what Sarah and, and the team in LIT had was a, they, they had the advantage of, of looking at, um, of being able to draw on the QQI blended learning guidelines um, uh, uh, to, 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 to develop their policy. Um, in step four of the guide, the drafting and enabling policy, um, there isn't there a, there isn't a benchmark or a mapping exercise uh, available. Um, so what what is uh, what occurs there is, is a series of questions are, are posed to the policy developers in the guide, um, depending on the topic. And the idea being that if you ask and answer those questions, you'll be able to develop policies relevant for that area. But that exercise is just kind of a, finding something to map against. Uh, I think is very uh, is very valuable. Um, in Sarah and LIT's case, they had they already had QQI blended learning um, policies. But for example. QQI do not have a blended, or do not have an online learning policy just yet. So we, we don't have something to map against there. Um, the next thing that kind of um, struck me as, as being really important that's not covered in the guide and Sarah has, has, has stressed is this idea of once you've gathered all your information together, um, setting about by saying, well, what is relevant for the policy and what is relevant for guidelines and what is relevant for procedure and being able to make that distinction between the, the, the detail that needs to go into a policy which is essentially just a series of principles to guide decision making and what needs to go into the guideline and what needs to go into the procedures. Um, and I think the guide for developing enabling policies could have could have maybe fleshed that out better and done more on that area. Um, I'm, I'm not actually looking at chat at the minute, but I hope uh, that people are throwing contributions in there um, and, and, um, and um, maybe highlighting some of the areas where they feel the guide could be developed uh, in order for it to be more reflective of their practice of developing policies in their institutes. Um, I might just move on to the next slide, please. Um, 
And so what we're going to do now is, is move on to that second aspect of the guide, which is this different definition of enabling, something we struggled with, with the, when the guide was being put together in the forum um, back in 2017-18. Um, so someone's going to post a, a link, to, I see it now going into the chat, to a Mentimeter. And what we're going to do is ask you to, um, uh, to add in some characteristics that you think are essential to make a policy enabling. Um, in the next couple of slides, we're going to move on to look at the, the, the national forms definition of an enabling policy. But before we do that, if we could really start to see some contributions from yourselves in one word or a short phrase to say what you think is about a policy that makes it enabling. So I'm going to leave that for about 30 seconds and um, hopefully we'll see a, a cloud emerging. Just to say that um, Catherine uh, Cronin put this out on Twitter the other day and um, a couple of things that um, came back in terms of uh, what what people on Twitter were saying uh, were characteristics of an enabling policy were the idea that it promotes inclusiveness and pra inclusive practices and also that it supports collegiality. So what is it? So uh, inclusive accessibility, yeah. Clarity, yes. Mm -hmm. Nothing like nothing like a model policy to disrupt you. Uh, broad principles, accessible coming back again. Inclusive is a big aspect. I'm wondering to what extent we're talking inclusive there. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's in terms of the consultation process, ensure that everybody's voice is represented. Easy to understand, yeah, there's nothing like uh, policy wonky language to destroy you. Okay, I'm just gonna give it another 10 seconds. Okay, um, so the, the, the headline information there, I think is this idea that they're easy to understand. Inclusive is just big and bold. There's no getting away from that. And I and, and think my colleagues, uh, uh, Chloe and Neve are gonna to touch on some more of that later on uh, in this presentation, this, in this webinar. Um, but practical, accessible, simple, easy to understand, inclusive. Um, basically things that make our lives easier, <laughs> I think is, is what's key. Um, so if I, if, I, um, if I move on to the next slide there, please. So as far as the, um, as far as the National Forum's Guide to Developing and Living Policies, we came up with these three categories, uh, implementable, situated in practice and reflective of HEI priorities. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we'll see a breakdown of the, those three areas into these 10 characteristics. And I think the, uh, the words inclusive, the words easy to understand are not appearing there. So that's interesting. Um, but for me, for me, what I'd like to highlight, um, reflecting on Sarah's story, is um, uh, I, I suppose the characteristics that I, I think, and I've seen some conversation uh, in, in chat about this, I think the, 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 ask, the characteristics of an enabling policy that are most difficult to, to get right or to, to, to get a handle on is this idea of it being situated in practice. And specifically, as I referred to earlier, this idea of how do we define consultation and how wide do we want to go? And I think that, that, that probably keys into the idea of, um, of um, uh, inclusivity. Um, also, how, how can we test at an operational level? How do we test policies and make sure that they're situated in practice? I think it's, it's also kind of very tricky and difficult to manage aspect of developing policies to ensure that what we've got is really going to work in, in I think as Mark Brown referred to earlier in chat, uh, policies with a small p. Um, so th they're, the, they're the kind of main, main areas that, that, that kind of come out of, a, out of Sarah's story for me when I think about making a policy enabling. Um, but to, there are many other gaps and there are many areas in which this, this, this definition of enabling policies can be developed. And, and for that, um, I'm going to, um, to, to help identify more gaps, I'm going to pass on to uh, Chloe and to Neve and to thank you for your contributions into the Mentimeter and also your contributions into chat. So um, Chloe, I think you're taking over from here. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, so I suppose what um, myself and Eve are going to talk about is the kind of um, engagement and partnership element of policy making. And really what can be seen there from the Mentimeter is the, the word inclusive was, was really quite large there in, in, in terms of 
what was coming out of what an enabling policy looked like. So in terms of inclusivity, I suppose uh, the real question for this section for me is, what should we mean when we say engagement in relation to developing policy, or in fact, engaging with students in general? So when it comes to engagement and partnership, there's a spectrum of engagement, you know, from name only engagement to actual partnership. So to begin today, I have some relevant, relevant sorry, uh, findings from some recent research. The first being the one on the screen there, the, which is from the index survey findings from last year, which notes that 27% of students and 14% of staff who teach agreed that they were given the opportunity to be involved in decisions regarding digital services. So that's pretty stark when you think about it. They're not, they're not wonderful numbers. So in terms of the context, that we're discussing engagement and partnership here, it's important to consider what's changed over the past year and how that's going to change policy, et cetera. So on the next slide, we have some of the things that's changed. So, you know, digital policies were tested in many new ways, along with people in general. Um, more students and staff who teach gained first-hand experience of digital and open practices. And there's been an increased interest and investment in the policies structures and decisions underpinning digital teaching and learning. Now, there may be a preconceived idea that students uh, don't want to be involved in policy development or decision making. That's probably not something that you think the average student walking around on campus is uh, invested in. But in my experience, this is not the case. Students, I found, are always willing to discuss and share their perspectives and honestly, Sometimes they can have the most nuanced ideas and opinions uh, in the room, but the problem is with policy making, etc., that they aren't always given the opportunity to be in the room to give those opinions. So uh, recently, for me at a regional learning and teaching conference, I said when I was asked about student partnership that there should always be people who teach and people who learn sitting at the same table. Now, while this is true. Um, I'm not going to argue with myself, obviously. Uh, student partnership can and should be a lot more nuanced than this. For example, as part of my role as the student intern with the National Forum, I was involved with the recruitment of the Student Associate Assembly, which is over 40 students from over 30 HEIs in Ireland. So through the recruitment of these students, we set out to be intentionally equitable. So what this means is basically because this group is going to be giving feedback on both national and local issues, it needed to be diverse because not only to ensure that the kind of feedback we were getting was broad enough, but to ensure that we were really hearing and really looking at what types of students we were recruiting. So, you know, this then led us to having here and there students, postgraduate and undergraduate students, uh, international students, but then also we have students who are parents. Uh, mature students, uh, students with disabilities, and they all bring something different to the table. Now, that kind of considered approach, which seeks out really meaningful student engagement, can elevate the development of any policy or practice. And that consultation and input of students is essential going forward. And, you know, we really need this. So if you take, for example, on the next slide, um, studentsurvey.ie recently released its interim results bulletin, uh, which contained the results of nearly 50,000 student respondents across 25 HEIs. And there were seven questions involved in the student survey this year, um, which were based around the COVID-19 experience of students. So some of the findings of note there on the screen, when students were asked, what are the positive elements of the online learned, blended learning experience you want to keep when on campus studies resume? The, dominant response from first and final year undergraduate and taught postgraduate students reflected the idea of having recorded lectures even when we go back to uh, in-person teaching etc. So we know from studies like this as well as those conducted by the National Forum and other groups such as AHEAD that during the initial months of the pandemic it was found that barriers to learning uh, experienced by students were further exacerbated by the move to online and remote teaching and learning while some students found that the barriers to learning were fewer. Obviously, some students with disabilities found it, to learn, found it easier to learn remotely. Uh, similarly, students who found that the alternative assessment methods be, uh, being provided during the time of campus closures uh, suited their individual learning preferences. 
there's all these different kind of nuances and preferences from students, and these are going to need to be reflected in policies, etc. in the future. Like, on the other hand, exclusively online and remote learning did introduce new challenges and threw up disadvantages that none of us had previously considered. For example, if you live in a rural area and it's extremely difficult for you to get um, broadband that's able to withstand, you know, a Zoom call like this with several participants or, or classmates. So this was something that I really experienced this year while speaking with the aforementioned National Forum Student Assembly, and I noticed that students from areas of disadvantage, for example, rely the most exclusively on services that they can access on campus. And these students are also the least powerful insisting on the, that their needs are met and are the most dependent on their uh, school or college for their educational resources. So these are the kind of people, these are the kind of students that we need in the room, giving us the feedback to build a policy that is enabling and that is inclusive and that reflects their needs, but also, you know, the needs of the staff, et cetera, as well, because as we know, a lot of staff have also benefited from, from um, online learning, et cetera, and have had some of the same challenges, you know, and there are several of us who work in the National Forum who also live rurally, uh, myself being one of them, that um, I'm surprised my Zoom has stood up this long, to be really honest. Um, but, you know, similarly, whilst I was with Catherine recently doing a case study um, for, for the guide, the new guide that uh, Catherine and and Tony and Sarah and Eva are developing, it, um, it was really highlighted that the need for a policy in that particular institution really arose from the needs of the students. The students were the ones who were asking for it because they asked for it in order to provide them with the consistency and the clarity that they needed, which can often be reflected in staff too, who also need that consistency and clarity. And the student rep present outlined that the model they used to consult with students was really effective. They essentially used their class rep system to be able to liaise with as many students as possible and get garner as much feedback as possible on what students felt they needed. And what came out of this, this was that it allowed students to address the complexity of the issue. They weren't just asking for everything to be recorded and to never come to college again. You know, they were really thoughtful and nuanced in recognising that you know, certain things could be recorded and certain things shouldn't be recorded, i.e., you know, tutorials or seminars, which are often more personal and what people will share depending on the subject matter that they're discussing, i.e., if you study social care, it will be different to if you're studying um, something very technical like law or science. And these are the kinds of engagements and conversations we need to hear from students, and these are some of the reasons why we need to have meaningful partnerships and engagement with students. And these are two of the models, I think, from that case study and from the National Forum of being intentionally equitable and having a really considered approach to engagement of thinking about who are you including when you're talking about having students engaged in and in partnership with you in developing these policies. Because often we can say, OK, we've got the student union in the room, that's tick the box, we've got the students there, that's grand, they'll, they'll, they'll do almost. Um, but, you know, for really you know, moving forward and when developing policies surrounding both this topic and other topics. And as we look to the future, we must ensure that, you know, teaching and learning and its underpinning policies and structures are prepared for new trends, but that they're also developed alongside students, because without, without intentionally inviting them to the table, they can't be in the room where it happens. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass over to Neve now at this point to talk a little bit more about some of that stuff. Just unmuting myself there. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was a really invaluable perspective and so important for us to, to get that perspective from um, the students and from the student survey. Um, and, you know, on our last slide, what Chloe showed was this absolutely, you know, overwhelming number of students who look want, wanted to, who expressed a requirement for continued access to recorded lectures. So that's a, something that we could, we can think about while we're, while we're considering this area. During this section, I'm going to very briefly invite us all to think about what's involved with the creating an institutional or departmental policy that enables this kind of requirement, you know, let's say, for example, continued access to recorded lectures. In time, support 
supporting this intentional EDI, intentional equity and in, in, such as um, the, the likes that Chloe has presented. When we undertake to make this intentional equity an inherent part of our digital policy making, we are instantly committing to doing a lot more work. I'm sure we all realize this, to banishing our own preconceptions and counteracting our own assumptions, to genuine human engagement, to commit to personal learning at the level of all of the individuals who are involved in the policy making, and we commit to creating actions that are based on our learning. And of course, that's not easy. We work in higher education institutions that between ourselves are rooted in medieval um, institutions, and some of them, we can admit, are still based largely on practically feudal structures with rigid hierarchical delineation of roles and deeply entrenched systems of power, privilege and communication that accompany those kinds of hierarchies. Yeah, I come from a university library, they have their own arcane caste system and rules deeply involved in digital um, decision making policy making, but almost destined to almost guaranteed to create policies that reinforce compound and actually exacerbate existing privileges and, and inequities unless they consciously become engaged in this, this inclusive equity. So, so let's take a look. I've got a couple of examples just from my own area of um, to, to have a look at what's involved in this. The first one um, on this slide is, and yeah, thanks a million for clicking. No, please click through those animations because um, we won't be able to manage it otherwise. I'm quoting liberally from our own wonderful Catherine Cronin on this slide, who I, I use, as, use her work, her book on open education, Walking a Critical Path, um, her chapter and the references there as a key text in op the open librarianship course that I run in, in um, that I teach in uh, Dublin Business School. The open access agenda is something that's kind of related to this example of, you know, making recorded lectures uh, available. Um, the openness is an obvious good, isn't it? You know, it's like motherhood and apple pie. We all know what it means and clear benefits that arise from it are do we? The current open policies, open access policies of universities and research funders in the global north are increasingly focused on systemizing the payment of article processing charges to make to academic publishers to make open access pub, uh, publications more readily available. It's a good thing. But when I asked Charlotte, who many of you would know from the University of Cape Town, are our open access policies on the global north hurting colleagues? in the global south and in South Africa in particular, she replied unequivocally and to the horror of me and my fellow open access advocates, yes, they are, right? So um, this deceptively simple term hides their open, hides a reef of complexity and we have to consider the context. And again, quoting from, uh, from, um, from Catherine, we have to ask these difficult questions when we're developing any kind of policy about power and participation and particular in, in addition to the questions we're asking about the specific area, be it openness, be it um, engagement or um, making recorded lectures available, and we must ask who's in our classroom and institutions and why are they there? Who's not in our classrooms and our institutions and why not? Who is excluded? And who might be silenced by systems, policies and practices that skew attention and rewards towards, and we're going to name it, white, male, privileged, global north experiences and priorities. So the first thing we have to do is to own this system of privilege. As Audrey Waters said, we need an ethics of care and of justice and not simply assume that open or inclusive or equity is going to just do it for us and cover it for us. Okay, so the next um, issue that I'm going to, a quick example that I give you, and I'll go very quickly through this, is on engagement. So engagement is, is an agenda that's um, strongly encouraged within our institutions and by internal and external policymakers. We've learned that true engagement is not simply an afterthought or a bolt on that's kind of tacked on at the end of a, an initiative. What I'm suggesting here, and you can have a look at this later on, if you just click um, to, the, to the animation, is the EXA 10 principles for a citizen science. They lay out good practice terms for terms of engagement. And maybe we can sit, consider that some of these could usefully be adapted for intentional equity and inclusion in digital policymaking. 
So in embracing an aversion of those principles, we'd, um, we'd, we would undertake to actively involve our participants to make sure that we have genuine outcomes, that everybody involved benefits from taking part, and that there are different multiple stages or options of participation that we're, they just don't come in at the end. And um, that feedback is guaranteed and, and delivered at all stages. And that there's patients and bias that have to be and controlled for. Um, and that information is available about this activity that our participants are also acknowledged in their results and in the publications and that they were true participants in that um, and that the projects are evaluated correctly and Tony touched on this and, and this is a, an, an output throughout our, our a concept throughout this discussion, the evaluation of, um, of policy, digital policy making and where does this kind of inclusion and engagement come in um, and that leaders of the projects take into consideration all of the aspects of the legal ethical issues that are concerned with this kind of participation. I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotations just to kind of trigger people's, um, I suppose, thoughts. Um, first of all, um, both from Nova Reid, and the first one is that diversity without inclusion is just tokenism. And the second one is diversity is a fact. Inclusion is an action. And I'm going to hand over to Chloe again, who's going to talk to us about next steps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neve. That was great. So I suppose going from all of this, um, the question really is, uh, what now? So now we really have an opportunity for meaningful involvement of students and staff in decision making and the creation of enabling policies, policies for digital and open teaching and learning going forward. So just I've thrown in some uh, useful resources uh, there that um, are quite recent. Um, the um, National Student Engagement Programme recently released its Steps to Partnership framework, which is um, very useful. And the National Forum has a guiding framework for embedding student, student success, which also talks about, you know, engagement and inclusion, etc. And there will be a toolkit for that um, released later in the year as well. So I think I'm going to hand back to Catherine now, who's going to lead the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um... Sarah and Neve and Tony and Chloe, 